After meeting Matt Damon on the set of Goodwill Hunting, director Steven Spielberg cast him in the brief title role in the 1998 World War II film Saving Private Ryan. He co-starred with Edward Norton in the poker film Rounders, also released in 1998, which despite meager earnings in the box office, is considered one of the greatest poker movies of all time. Damon then portrayed anti-hero Tom Ripley in The Talented Mr. Ripley, released in 1999, which is an adaptation of Patricia Highsmith's 1955 novel of the same name. The film co-starred Jude Law, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Kate Blanchett, and received praise from critics. Along with Ben Affleck, he played a fallen angel in Kevin Smith's Dogma, also released in 1999. The film received positive reviews, but proved controversial among religious groups who deemed it blasphemous. Damon's attempts at leading characters in romantic dramas such as All the Pretty Horses, released in 2000, and The Legend of Bagger Vance, also released in 2000, were commercially and critically unsuccessful. But also during this period, Damon joined two lucrative film series, The Ocean's Trilogy and Born, and produced the television series Project Greenlight uh, from 2001 to 2005 and also in 2015. In the former's first installment, Steven Soderbergh's Ocean Eleven, released in 2001, is a remake of the Rat Pack's Ocean Eleven, um, released in 1960. The film was a box office hit, grossing $450 million from a budget of $83 million. Damon, alongside Ben Affleck and others, produced the documentary Project Greenlight, aired on HBO and later Bravo, which helps newcomers develop their first film. In 2002, Damon wrote and starred in Jerry, a drama about two friends who forget to bring water and food when they go hiking in a desert. The movie was a critical success, but a commercial failure. Uh, Damon then played amnesiac assassin Jason Bourne in Doug Liman's action thriller, The Bourne Identity, also released in 2002. I purchased this movie during the pandemic in the Movies You Buy bin at CVS for $4.99. This is well within the parameters imposed for a low-budget review. Uh, The interesting thing about this DVD is that it's part of a Universal Films 3-pack. In some cases, this might mean three movies crammed onto one DVD, or in the case of the Will Ferrell 3-pack, three movies on two DVDs. But no, this was different. It had three movies on three separate DVDs. I know the cost of manufacturing a DVD is at most 25 cents. At least I think it is, unless they figure out a way to make make it even cheaper. Uh, But this was still a pretty good deal. Three movies, three separate DVDs, $4.99. I've only watched The Bourne Identity. I'll watch the other two movies in subsequent weeks. Uh, But yeah, this was a pretty good deal. I'll give you $10,000 to drive me to Paris. I can't remember anything that happened before two weeks ago. Trained by the government. He's got a black ops agent. He's off the reservation. Taught to disappear. I don't even know who I'm hiding from. I gotta figure this out. Born to survive. You! Stop right there! On June 14th, Matt Damon... This is not gonna stop. ...is Jason Bourne. What are you gonna do? I'm full of surprises. The Bourne Identity. Rated PG-13. At theaters Friday, June 14th. The movie begins in the Mediterranean Sea, where Italian fishermen recover the apparently dead body of a man, played by Matt Damon, adrift with two gunshot wounds in his back. They find that the man is alive and tend to his wounds, and find a tiny laser projector under his skin that gives the number of a safe deposit box in Zurich, Switzerland. In spite of the captain of the ship saying everything will come back to him, he does not remember his name but over the trip, he demonstrates advanced combat skills and fluency in several languages. In spite of it all, he hasn't remembered his identity by the time the ship docks. The man goes to the bank in Zurich to investigate and finds passports, IDs with different names, and various currencies. 
He starts using the name on the American passport, Jason Bourne. After Bourne has left the bank, a bank employee contacts Operation Treadstone, a CIA black ops program. Treadstone's head, Conklin, played by Chris Cooper, issues alerts to police to capture Bourne and assigns three agents to kill him. Castell, played by Nikki Node, uh, Mannheim, played by Russell Levy, and The Professor, played by Clive Owen. The CIA deputy director contacts Conklin about a failed assassination attempt uh, against exiled African dictator Wambosi, played by Adewale Akinui Abaje. And Conklin promises he will deal with the agent who failed. Bourne enters the American consulate, but he is found out and pursued by Marine guards. He escapes by climbing off of a balcony and offers Marie Kreutz, played by Franca Potent, who is a 26 year old German woman who he saw at the consulate, $20,000 to drive him to Paris. When they get to Paris, they enter an apartment where Bourne contacts the hotel through the phone. He asks about the names on the passports and learns that John Michael Kane was registered at the hotel but died two weeks earlier in a car crash. Castell breaks into the apartment, ambushing Bourne and Marie. Bourne gets the upper hand and Castell, rather than allowing himself to be interrogated, jumps out a window and dies. Marie searches through Castell's belongings and finds wanted posters of Bourne and herself. She agrees to help him. The two escape avoiding the police in Marie's car, and they spend the night in a Paris hotel. Wambosi is obsessed over his attempted assassination, and to placate him, Conklin places a body to pose as John Michael Caine, the alleged assailant. Wambosi remains unconvinced and threatens to report the CIA's actions to the press. Uh, the professor then assassinates Wambosi on Conklin's orders. Bourne, reading a newspaper, learns about the failed assassination attempt on Wambosi's yacht. He surmises that he was the assassin. Assassin, rather. Uh, Marie is afraid of him and tries to leave, but Bourne convinces her that they should stick together. They take refuge at uh, the French countryside home of Marie's half-brother, Eamon, played by Tim Dutton, and his children. Under pressure from Abbott, who's played by Brian Cox, Conklin tracks Bourne's location and sends the professor to kill him. Uh, Bourne, Bourne shoots the professor, and as he is dying, he reveals their shared connection to Treadstone. Bourne sends Marie, Eamon, and the children away for their protection. He then contacts Conklin via the professor's phone, and they agree to meet alone in Paris. He agrees to meet Conklin in the middle of a bridge. When Bourne sees that Conklin is not alone, he abandons their meeting but puts a tracking device on Conklin's car, leading Bourne to Treadstone's safe house in Paris. Bourne breaks in and holds Conklin and Conklin's technician, played by Julia Stiles, at gunpoint. Um, Conklin reveals to Bourne his association with Treadstone and gets him to remember his past, and Bourne remembers his attempt to assassinate Wambosi. On his yacht, Bourne got close enough to assassinate him, but he couldn't find the nerve to kill Wambosi while his children were pre present. Instead, Bourne fled, being shot during his escape and getting amnesia. Bourne announces that he is resigning from Treadstone and warns Conklin not to follow him. Agents surround Bourne, and Bourne fights his way through them and escapes. When Conklin leaves the safe house, he's killed by Mannheim, who killed him under Abbott's orders. Abbott then shuts down Treadstone and reports to an oversight committee that Treadstone is decommissioned before he starts to talk about a new project called Blackbriar. A few months later, Bourne finds Marie renting out jet skis to tourists in on Maikanos, a Greek island. And that's where the movie ends. The Bourne Identity was released in June 2002. And in many ways, it was a film inconsistent with the era. The movie was released nine months after the September 11th attacks on the United States. And the United States essentially had a great deal of moral authority. Uh, for no other reason than because it was attacked on uh, U.S. soil. They took advantage of this to attempt regime change in several countries. At least the government uh, took advantage of this. Uh, to attempt regime change in several countries. 
generally making a mess of things in, in these countries and in other places. And even in countries where regime change was successful, things really didn't work out in the long term, uh, at least in terms of American interests. Witness Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya. Um, but in 2002, nobody knew about this, and George W. Bush enjoyed an average approval rating of 71.4%. This led to the 2002 khaki election in which the Republicans won eight seats in the House of Representatives and two seats in the Senate. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but keep in mind that that usually in off year election, um, the in, the party in, in, in power, the, the party that has that has the presidency loses seats. Um, so this would be the Republicans. So the Republicans should lose seats in 2002. Well, not only did they not lose seats, but they actually gained some seats. Um, so basically, it turned they it turned the the Republican majority to a slim majority to a somewhat fatter majority, and two seats basically flipped the Senate from a uh, um, uh, 51-49 uh, uh, Democratic majority to a 51-49 Republican majority. Uh, this trend follows us on a statewide level, with Republicans holding a majority of state legislative seats for the first time in 50 years. In popular culture, the TV series 24, in which Kiefer Sutherland played Jack Bauer, an agent with the counterterrorism unit whose mandate is to protect the United States from terrorist plots, captured the zeitgeist of the epoch. One of uh, Bauer's often repeated lines are, you're going to have to trust me. And that seems right. Does it not? Uh, you can trust the government, right? Um, but anyway, um, but in many ways, dark spy thrillers are nothing new. Sure, there was the James Bond movies, uh, where the focus seemed to be on more on gadgets and girls, but there was also, if you remember, uh, Danger Man. They would be retitled for American audiences as a secret agent. On this series, Patrick McGoon played John Drake, a secret agent for NATO and later M9, a department of the British government. Drake is sometimes at odds with his superiors about the ethics of his missions. This eventually morphed into another series called The Prisoner. In this series, McGoon again played the lead role as number six, an unnamed British intelligence agent who is abducted and imprisoned in a mysterious coastal village. Prisoners in the village are people who know too much, they hold secrets that their governments don't want revealed, which is their their one and only crime. At least it's the crime for which they're in prison. There, it is implied that is not just one government that maintains the village, as the girl in the first episode says. The village is very international. It is never established whether the Western powers maintain the village or the East Bloc, or perhaps as number two. Leo McKern, played by Leo McKern, suggests that both powers created the village as an example of condominium. Codominium, on the other hand, is incidentally is a series of future history novels written by sci-fi writer Jerry Pornell, um, late Jerry Pornell, and several co-authors, uh, which chronicles the political alliance and union between the United States and the Soviet Union to maintain planetary stability and eventually a de facto planetary government and later interstellar empire. And I think one of the other authors was Larry Niven. Uh, thus, epic notwithstanding, popular culture has had its history of dark spy thrillers. But the Bourne identity is far darker. In an era where more people trusted the CIA, Jason Bourne is an assassin for the CIA. He's part of the Black Ops uh, team. Uh, he assassinates foreign politicians, which isn't the same as assassinating foreign leaders. Um, so it's important to it's an important distinction where Wambosi is not the, uh, the dictator of an African country, but he's the ex-dictator of an African country. But it's still pretty close. When he fails in his mission, the CIA deploys Black Ops to assassinate him. In many cases, the moral of the story is that the ends don't justify the means. But here, the ends don't seem too sublime either. The state is assassinating a politician from another state, presumably to gain power, whatever that means, so that the USA can score another point in this real-world version of risk. 
If the born identity were a true story, then one could conclude that the CIA is a nefarious institution that should no longer exist. Um, so this is where, you know, I, I might risk uh, you know, being demonetized by uh, YouTube or getting, getting banned from YouTube. But anyway, uh, at the risk of, 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 of getting a strike against me, um, when in the last few years we've seen the CIA, uh, the abbreviation of the Central Intelligence Agency, is basically a contradiction in terms. When over 30 intelligence officers claim that the Hunter Biden laptop has all the har hallmarks of a Russian intelligence operation, when it's been proven that the laptop, A, the laptop exists, and in fact, B, once belonged to Hunter Biden, then the Central Intelligence Agency is not giving the American people or its leaders much intelligence. Rather, the agency seems to be giving the American people propaganda. Um, so, political commentary ends here. Um, the storyline of the border identities is not entirely original. Still, the movie achieves a freshness by not being a typical spy movie. Um, although the movie has a decent budget, um, and the budget was like $60 million, and the box office gross was $214 million, so it was a box office success, a lot of the memorable moments are not achieved with flashy special effects. In fact, one of the more memorable scenes is when Bourne evades the police in a car chase using a red mini, and it's, it's described in one of the, the DVD extras as a, 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 you know, you can barely drive this car. Uh, this proves that it's not the car, but it's who's driving it. Another memorable scene is in the staircase shootout scene towards the end is the staircase shootout scene towards the end of the movie, which achieves its intensity through good choreography and camera work. The movie, this movie is a good action movie and somehow allows a unique blend of tension and mystery. Tony Gilroy and William Blank Hair. William Blake Heron wrote a screenplay that expertly adopts the original novel written by the late Robert Ludlum, The Big Screen. Um, so I, I didn't read the, the novel, so I think I'm, I'm probably going to do this my homework. I'm going to read the, read the novel over the next few days. Also, Matt Damon is convincing as the hero of the movie, uh, Jason Bourne. Franca Potent is a, is good as the female lead, and there's some some chemistry between her and Damon, and her portrayal of Marie Kreutz puts an interesting spin of the damsel who's not quite in distress. Uh, this movie has a PG-13 rating for violence in some language. This is the rating that I expect to see on this movie. There's really nothing in this movie that, that offends. And uh, let's see this. Oh, here, um, sex and nudity. Passionate kissing is shown briefly. The woman is in a bra, no male or female nudity. A large billboard poster showing a woman in a bikini in one quick shop, shot, fairly prominent. An unconscious man lies face down after part of waist. Wetsuit is taken off, very brief shot of his hip as a man size, inside a small scar on his hip. Removing an ID chip, no nudity shown. A young woman hugs a young man multiple times while wearing a halter top. Um, Burns shoots a gas tank tank causing a large explosion, blinding a nearby sniper. Sniper shoots. So this is like, there's a lot of violence in it. But, uh, it's, um, at least in America, it's, it, you don't really, uh, you can do violence and not get a bad rating. Uh, so this is ranked PG-13, PG which I expected it to have. Um, oh yeah. And so for all those who, who, who are um, were cynical about, about a United States and so so you potentially like United. Well, just remember that all all empires end. And uh, so in 1971, if you said that the Soviet Union has 20 years to um, to exist, people would have said you're crazy. But that's what happened. Uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, oh broke up in 1991 um and then like so the united states um yes um the chief executive may may think that the united states can take on, on two wars uh because it's it's like it's uh 
it's America. And but this is not 1945. This is uh, 2023. Um, so you have like uh, um, the current context is that that um, you have the this uh, tension in Gaza. Or I I really want there to be peace, but it seems apparent that the Israelis and the Palestinians are going to kill each other. So there's nothing we can do about that. So the United States should probably stay out of it. But as they are want to do, American politicians are going to intervene. Um, so anyway, that's my take on that. Um, in summary, The Born Identity stands as a good movie and a prime exemplar of the action thriller film. The movie has a cynical theme to it, but doesn't give in to hopelessness. In the context of the time in which it was released, it stands as a healthy contrast to James Bond movies and TV shows such as 24. And overall, the acting is quite good, especially Matt Damon, Damon's, who portrays the role of an amnesiac assassin in a sincere way. It is by no means a classic, but is still a very good movie worthy of holding your attention through the two hours of running time of the movie, which because of its fast-paced nature, seems to run for about a half hour or less. Overall, I give the movie an 8 out of 10. This DVD had a lot of extras. If, if I didn't mention it before, uh, this is uh, the from the movies you buy been in in CVS and there is a three pack and there are actually three separate DVDs it, it could have had like just one DVD for all three movies or two DVDs but it actually gives you three separate DVDs um, so in the in the bonus material section there's the opening and alternate ending total time of all segments is about 10 minutes there's also the brief a brief documentary on the late Robert Ludlum which is less than 6 minutes a brief interview with screenwriter Tony Gilroy a little over 4 minutes a brief documentary called From Identity to Supremacy Jason and Marie which Matt Damon and Frank Frank Portent uh, describe their uh, characters which is less than 4 minutes um, and a brief documentary called The Born Diagnosis which a UCLA doctor explains amnesia. But wait, there's more. I thought that was the end of the of the the uh, bonus section, but there's actually another. I clicked on more, and there's actually more uh, content. There's a documentary on the CIA, which is less than six minutes long. A documentary on the car, car trace sequence, a little over four minutes. A library of deleted scenes. A documentary called Inside a Fight Se Sequence, which is less than five minutes long. Uh, a Moby video. Apparently, Moby recorded a song that has something to do with this movie. Uh, the cast and filmmakers, production notes, and DVD credits. You can listen to the movie in English or dubbed into Spanish or French, all in 5.1 surround sound. You can activate English captioning or Spanish and French subtitles. You can select a specific scene or you can watch the whole movie. And, well, there, there wasn't anything of significant length in the bonus materials. There, there was a lot of them, and uh, there was enough foreign language options so that if English is not your native tongue, you have a decent number of options. Overall, there's enough extras here to satisfy anyone who wants a deep dive into the making of the born identity. The Born Identity is an excellent spy thriller, and the DVD extras make this an awesome DVD. The price of the DVD alone makes this three movie pack worth $4.91, but alas, there are two movies left to evaluate. So I'm going to tentatively highly recommend this DVD three movie pack, although I still have to review the rema two remaining DVDs, but not next week. I'm reviewing Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story. Well, that's it for this DVD review. I'll be back with a review of Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story next week. Like and comment on this review and subscribe to it so you'll be informed of the next low budget review. As always, thanks for watching.